Forget gurus. Forget anyone claiming to be an online business expert without going through the challenges of entrepreneurship themselves. The Real Money, Real Business podcast is here to prove the best insights in online business comes from your fellow online business builders. We dig into stories of entrepreneurs selling their business on the Empire Flippers marketplace so that you can learn how they made their business profitable, how they overcame obstacles, and what lessons they learned in their online journey. If you want to take your business and your knowledge to the next level, you've come to the right podcast. Let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Real Money, Real Business podcast. We record these interviews so potential buyers have more information about the seller and the business to help them make a buying decision. Now, before we dive in, let's go over a brief summary of this business. It's an Amazon FBA, Amazon FBM, and e-commerce business created in July of 2016 in the lifestyle niche. The average monthly revenue for the business is $64,828 and makes an average of $24,010 per month in net profit. The assets included in the sale are an Amazon Seller Central account, domain and all-site content and files, supplier relationships, Shopify account, social media account and page, which is Facebook page, trademarks, an email list with around 3,500 subscribers, and just as a disclaimer, inventory is not normally included in the list price, but further details can be provided to unlockers. And as another disclaimer, buyers should have an active VAT number in all UK and EU countries where this business has inventory stored before the transfer can finalize. And it's highly recommended to begin the VAT registration process as soon as possible. So for everyone listening, you can visit empireflippers.com marketplace and search for listing 62577 to learn more about the business. Or you can unlock this listing to start your due diligence if you're interested in purchasing this asset. So that's a brief overview of the business for sale. So let's hear from the seller with me today. So welcome to the show, John. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to learning more about you and your business. So to get us started, John, can you tell us a little bit about your background in building and running online businesses? Well, most of my businesses before have been more brick and mortar. I did move to online businesses maybe about 15 years ago, but generally they weren't e-commerce. They were more sports and data related. And so I got involved in more e-commerce a couple of years before this one. And the niche is one I'm familiar with. And I started to look at it and who the players were and what they were offering. And I felt I could get in there and mix it up and do okay. And so here I am years later. Got it. Wow. So you came from a completely unrelated field in brick and mortar, and then you arrived at this niche. Was there a lot of research done behind the niche, or did you just kind of see who the players were and realize you can just do this better? There was some research done. Initially, it was accidental where I was making a purchase in the niche itself from other retailers. And I started to get curious. It just raised my eyebrow at kind of the process So it kind of started accidentally. And then I was involved in another brick and mortar business. My lease was coming to an end. So I started to pivot toward and explore getting into this one. And that's kind of how it started. Got it. Very cool. And it's been about six years that you've had this business, that you've been operating this business. So why are you deciding to sell it now instead of keeping it and growing it further? Well, I like my business. I'm sitting at my shop now as I talk to you. I would like to claim some of my time back and maybe try a few other things. I like kind of starting from the ground up, and I did that with this business. So I had some ideas on doing it in some other businesses or some other fields, and it's quicker to sell my business, I think, than to just simply make adjustments so it can require less of my time. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And I've actually heard that a few times from sellers. First being that they like the building element to it and they want to kind of keep doing that with other businesses and having to make the decision between, all right, I'm going to exit, have the capital to then be able to focus fully on building something versus trying to set up systems to make this more efficient to potentially allow me to step away from it, then yeah, the decision was ultimately and very commonly to exit and have that capital and more importantly, the time to think about those other things. So yeah, definitely makes sense. So 
this business has certainly seen a lot of success. What did you learn from building this that worked or that contributed to that success, would you say? The biggest thing I learned was that I could not simply buy other people's stuff and try and sell it. I learned that early on. When I first got into this business, I considered myself an online retailer where I would buy my products from other people. And then I basically learned in that process, well, what I got from that was I was too far removed from the product. I had to become a creator. A lot of my investigative work, a lot of my research pivoted from, okay, I got my business. Now I want to do, how can I be one of the guys I'm buying off of rather than just some guy that's selling this stuff? Mm -hmm. I felt like I was busting my ass selling my stuff and there wasn't enough profit in it. And then a lot of it, I felt like I'm dealing with the maker himself. And also I looked around and I go, well, there's not much here. I could do this. I can make better stuff or I can make more designs. That's what the ball rolling to the business where it is now. So I had to pivot from simply being a retailer of other people's stuff to being a creator and manufacturer. Yeah. And so you're more referring to the fact that the margins weren't there when you were selling other people's stuff, that you can customize, kind of design your own products and appeal more to the market that way. Yeah. It's also a little ego driven too. I felt like I'm busting my ass here to sell other people's stuff. I'm like, I don't think so. You know, and then (laughs) it also, there were other restrictions there that you come up against and I just wasn't interested. So I said, okay, I'll be there. I have an idea. And I just decided to do what they do. And that's where I am now. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you kind of answered this question and the first one as well, but I'll just ask this anyways. Was there anything you tried with this business that didn't work out as well? I mean, I know you mentioned selling other people's products, but yeah. yeah, was there anything else that you wanted to mention about? Yes. That thing where I tried that, I mean, that was a fundamental thing where I decided on this particular niche. And then once I got in though and pivoted and started to make my own and develop my own stuff, I found that ego got in the way. I wanted to do everything for this niche and provide all the different products. And so I started doing things, getting into clothing and some other offshoots and trying to do that. And so the business as you see it now is streamed down where I focus just in on one particular product and its variants rather than different products to the same market. I suffered when I did that, trying to do too much. So I got rid of a couple other machines, inventory, et cetera, and I started focusing on becoming more efficient and more streamlined. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of pressure to try to move horizontally with a lot of different product types, thinking that you know the customer has different needs or there are different potential needs that I can resolve. And it's kind of a sign of wisdom to say, all right, I'm going to focus on what's working. I'm going to double down on that. I'm going to go vertical and build my company that way. And you proof that you can build a very large business just from doing that. So that's great to see. Cool. So let's talk about the work required. I mean, you've had this business for a few years now, and typically that means that you're more in a maintenance mode as opposed to a growth mode where you're figuring things out and experimenting still. Can you describe the amount and the type of work that you do on this business currently for maintenance? Well, my work now is basically creating new stuff in order to keep things fresh. Also, I like to create things because I found myself getting too stuck on a particular design or a couple of early ones that worked well, and I kind of sat on my ass. And then I see other people came out with stuff that I really liked. So a lot of my time now is spent coming up with design ideas or concepts and then testing them and seeing if they work and then committing to that design after it's been accepted. Where in the beginning, I often overcommitted sometimes on designs I thought would sell better. And, you know, I thought I knew what was best. And I didn't. Mm. I have to let the market decide what they like. And so it's development of ideas and designs. And then the day-to-day stuff is keeping an eye on inventory. And basically, I've turned into a designer and a shipper of this particular product. So I'm sending, like I sent stuff to Amazon this morning. You know, I try and do it near the first of the month. Yeah. And that's pretty cool with this product that you have that option to test. I assume you're just testing very small quantities at this point, And then you're able to order larger amounts after that because of that. And it's probably less expensive to produce each unit than you have that option to do that as part of your business model. 
Yeah. And I have enough customers now and the mailing list and I deal with people that retail my products. And also I can run them on Amazon and I'll just buy a small run of pieces and see how they do. And, you know, I'll do some PPC on them or whatever. Well, I'll just simply show them to my mailing list, my customers and see what they think. And then I can commit more if they like it. Okay. That's interesting. Not every Amazon seller has that luxury to be able to communicate with their customer base and say, Hey, what do you think about this product? I'm thinking about launching this. So yeah. that's great. You don't even have to spend any money on inventory to test that. I get a physical product in hand. I take pictures. I treat it as if it's oh, okay. Got a product it. and I'll send it out in a mailer or because I have a physical product, I'll put it for sale on the site or on Amazon and just limit how many I sell and just see what happens and see what kind of reaction I get. Or I've also included things I like in a package to a customer and ask them for their feedback or something like mm. that, anything to just get it in front of them. Okay, very cool. Yeah, that's very exciting. And that kind of leads to the next question about growth opportunities. It seems like you have a very streamlined method of growing your designs, but if you were to keep the business, what are some ways that you could see yourself trying to grow it? If I continue on with the business... I consider there's two avenues that I go after. First one is building up the wholesale outside of Amazon. So there are a lot of resellers or people that are in this niche that are businesses, you know, that I would offer wholesale pricing to. Most of the time I just get it word of mouth or just because I know people in the marketplace, I develop relationships over time. But there are a lot of people out there that, in my opinion, qualify purchasing wholesale that may not even know it or even have thought of it. And, you know, I just feel like I have a big list of 2000 businesses that I would attack. As I sit here, I have about 40 million labels on the table here that I plan to put together a little package and send it out just to see if, if I get any bites. The second thing I would do would be expansion of the products into other Amazon marketplaces. I sell in UK, Canada, a little bit of Mexico, and also, I'm listed on Walmart. I don't do any advertising there. I do get sales, but Walmart to me has a pretty big upside, in my opinion. So that's something I'd focus on as well. Nice. And it's a good sign when you are not running any advertising on some of these comparatively smaller platforms, but you're still getting sales. So that's a sign of a growth opportunity should anybody want to spend more time and funding in that area. Just for the record, I don't spend advertising on my conventional site or for the wholesale. I don't do any advertising. I will advertise, though, when I do my merchant fulfilled orders on Amazon. You know, I give them a free chip. I give them a little promotional thing. And so I make Amazon kind of work for me, if that makes sense, when I'm filling my own order. And so I drive traffic to my site without paying for Google ads or anything like that or social media. You know. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm sure that's partially the email list. It sounds like you are utilizing the email list for both product design selection as well as some of these organic sales. Yeah. Okay, great. When I remember, I don't want you to think I'm this perfect guy sending out these <laughs> well-timed, well-placed mailers, you know, some well-oiled machines. No, when I get some time, I talk to the VA and I say, hey, let's schedule a couple of mailers. Let's focus on these products. I'll review it and then I'll tell her to schedule it and we'll send it out and then we get orders. Okay. Well, I'm hearing another opportunity then to, to just clean up operations, make it a bit more automated to continuously monetize that list, potentially, not saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that. I've been more active the last two months than I have in the last two and a half years on it. And I could carry on for the next half hour about my issues with MailChimp and how I think they charge too much and blah, blah, blah. But instead <laughs> of doing that, moaning about it, I just simply got off it. And now I'm using the in-house Shopify mailing system that gives you a certain amount of emails a month and the charger for usage after that rather than a flat fee. Mm, MailChimp okay. is driving me crazy. You know? Got it. Okay, cool. Now, what are the biggest risks with this business that a buyer should be aware of? I think the biggest risks would be rocking the boat. I don't get too cute with pricing. I don't know about you, but when I go and I buy something on Amazon, I go back and I buy it again 60 days or 90 days later, I notice that the guy realizes he's making sales and then he's gone up on the price three or $4. I don't do that. And any changes I make are incremental. I actually run specials on Amazon where I will lower the price of the product if it's not moving or just to simply see if it does anything. But I don't get too cute. 
things go well, my focus more would be on cutting back my expenses or trying to do things that save me time rather than getting too experimental. Things are okay as they are. Got it. And you see that as being a potential risk as far as alienating the customer base a little bit by trying to increase the price too much. Yeah. I mean, I've been guilty of myself where I go in and I think I know best or I think I know I can do it this way and that. But, you know, if a buyer comes in, he knows the market, that's different. But otherwise, you know, kind of sit back, don't rock the boat, get a lay of the land and then go with it. That's what I, the biggest threat would be coming in trying to top everything over. Got it. That's not too unlike a lot of e-commerce businesses. I mean, find me a group of customers that appreciates price increases or price manipulations. So yeah, I think people with e-commerce experience are probably familiar with that. Well, the last few housekeeping questions then, how much support are you willing to offer a new buyer? I'd be willing to stick around and answer questions for 60 days. You know, I always see 30 listed, but I know what it's like to take over something or start something new and you have a question. Most of the time I haven't, but I don't want somebody to feel uncomfortable or not call because it's been 38 days. So you're more than welcome to reach out for 60 days and I'll do my best to help or guide or smooth something out or give some input. Okay, great. And yeah, the default is typically 30 days, but that's generous of you to offer that additional 30 days. Okay. Next question then, just confirming that you commit to a non-compete on the business after it's sold? Agreed. Non-compete. I won't come in and compete against you. Okay, great. And are you open to something like an earnout? My first inclination is to say, no, probably not. Unless it was something that made sense or it was a really incentive laden for me to wait. Otherwise, I just like to move on and start something fresh and not have to worry about the past except just to worry about maybe a call coming or an email coming in and 60 days of support, which wouldn't be an issue. You know? Yep. Got it. Yeah. It sounds like that could be something to potentially discuss with a buyer, but yep. I understand. I'll certainly listen. Okay. Got it. So next question, putting yourself in the shoes of a buyer, why do you think this is a business worth buying? Simply because it makes money. It generates revenue. I've done a lot of the work. You know, I have several products and variants that just keep moving. Also, the biggest upside in this business is that it doesn't rotate around holidays or the fourth quarter or anything like that. It just keeps grinding out. You know, I would look at businesses a lot just personally, and I would say, oh, my God, if I miss the fourth quarter, it's not even worth getting. I don't want to wait. It's not like that with my business. And I did my best to do that on purpose, to get into something where I'm not relying upon a certain holiday or a certain time of the year. This thing just keeps grinding out. And so that, to me, is really the hidden value of it, is that you don't miss anything. How much seasonality to the business? Yeah. Water doesn't mean anything to it. You know, it's just the cold months, <laughs> you know. Okay. Got it. And it sounds like, in addition to what you said earlier about not really changing anything about the business, not changing the pricing, unless you come with that kind of experience, it sounds like it's not seasonal and you don't have to change a lot with the business. So it sounds like a low-touch type of operations in that regard, at least. Yeah. Okay. Well, John, is there anything you'd like to add that you think I might've missed during the interview? No, I'm all right. I'm assuming that if somebody has questions, they can just enter it on the site and I could be presented with them. So yeah, they can ask questions and they can also schedule a call with you to discuss the details of this business further. Works for me. Great. Well, I'll wrap this up here. So John, thanks so much for sharing your story and joining us on today's episode. And yeah, I hope your business is purchased in the near future and by the right buyer. All right. Thanks for having me, Nick. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. To learn more and see if this listing has already been sold, head over to empireflippers.com slash marketplace and search for listing number 62577. And if you're watching this on YouTube, click the link in the description to go straight to the listing. And once you've unlocked this listing, you'll be given everything you need to know about this business. So until next time, enjoy your digital journey.